starts right now. New this noon, we are on standby right now for a special report from ABC regarding uh, President-elect Biden and his cabinet members. We're going to go on with our show, but we'll interrupt if we need to. Meantime, a woman wanted for causing a deadly crash, then leaving the scene now in the custody of San Antonio police. 24-year-old Alex Rayner was killed in that October 24th crash on I-10 near I-37. Investigators say 22-year-old Mariah Flores caused that wreck and they were trying to find her. They did yesterday afternoon around 3.30. Police tell us Flores was seen driving a stolen vehicle and committing several traffic violations. Troopers with the Department of Public Safety pulled her over near Frio City Road in South Zarzamora. She was arrested. She faces multiple charges, including failure to stop and render aid, resulting in death and driving while intoxicated. A Westside family still reeling from an overnight home invasion. San Antonio police say some of the victims were restrained by five men who barged into their home. It happened on Cincinnati Street, not far from St. Mary's University. Katrina Weber has that story from Public Safety Headquarters and tells us the investigation is off to a slow start. Based on what officers shared with us, it seems that they didn't have a lot of information about those men involved in the home invasion. They say the only description they were given is that there were five of them all dressed in black. They made their presence known in a big way at the home in the 2400 block of Cincinnati. Police say the 52 year old victim told them the five men kicked in his front door before 2.30 this morning. Then once they were inside, they used zip ties to restrain him and a woman. The couple's daughter and granddaughter also were home at the time. The men told police that the robbers at first demanded drugs, but when they realized the family didn't have any, they grabbed their cell phones, cash, a TV, and the titles to their cars. Although no one was seriously hurt, they likely are shaken up about what happened. Again, those men were gone by the time officers arrived, and it seems they haven't made any arrests since. Reporting from Public Safety Headquarters, Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. We now know the name of the 66-year-old man killed after he was hit by a driver yesterday evening. Police identified him as Jose Jesus Manzanales. Officers tell us around 6 last night, Manzanales was trying to cross the street at the intersection of Gillette Boulevard and South Zarzamora when he was hit. That is on the city's south side. Police say the driver initially left the scene, but later returned and identified himself as 22-year-old Harley Damien de Bolsk. He was arrested and is facing a charge of failure to stop and render aid, resulting in death. Police are investigating a shooting that left one man in the hospital. Police tell us it happened around 1045 last night in the 400 block of Mickle John Drive. That's near Calabria in South Zorzamora on the west side. They say the victim was taken to an area hospital with multiple gunshot wounds. A witness told police they saw two people running through a nearby apartment complex after those shots were fired, but could not give a description. The victim is currently in critical condition. San Antonio Fire Department District Chief Douglas Berry has been suspended after he made inappropriate comments during a female firefighter job recommendation. Chief Berry received that suspension in September and ultimately forfeited 80 hours of vacation leave in lieu of serving it. Records show SAFD Chief Charles Hood became aware of Berry's quote, inappropriate comments earlier this year. City officials declined to describe exactly what Berry said, but some of the comments were made in August of 2018 after Barry was asked to make a job recommendation for a female firefighter. His suspension was for rules violations, which included conduct and behavior, relationships with coworkers, and mutual respect. Local health officials reporting 709 new cases of COVID-19 in Bear County. No new deaths have been reported, though. The seven-day moving average has increased to 549 cases per day. More than 500 patients are now in the hospital. 171 of those are on ICU, are in the ICU and 80 are on ventilators. Mayor Ron Nuremberg says the risk level is moderate. The positivity rate is now at 10%. Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf says new restrictions could be put in place in the, if the positivity rate stays at 10% for two consecutive weeks. Right now, nearly every state and territory in the U.S. is seeing a surge in coronavirus cases. And for the 14th consecutive day, the U.S. has set a record for current hospitalizations. As ABC's Rena Roy reports, despite warnings from health experts to stay home for Thanksgiving, millions are still traveling by plane or car. From coast to coast, many airports packed with travelers trying to get out for the holiday. All the airlines seem to be doing the good precautions, so 
yeah, so we're just, you know, we're trying to play it safe and we'll just live our lives as well. More than 3 million people screened at TSA checkpoints over the weekend, the most since the pandemic began, despite the CDC urging people to stay home and avoid travel. The nation's top infectious disease expert telling the Washington Post there may be consequences by the Christmas holiday. What we're doing now is going to be reflected two, three weeks from now. And right now in the U.S., the situation is dire since the beginning of the... We want to interrupt uh, at the moment because, as we said at the top of the newscast, there is a news conference going on right now with President-elect Joe Biden. America is back ready to lead the world, not retreat from it, once again sit at the head of the table, ready to confront our adversaries and not reject our allies, ready to stand up for our values. In fact, in calls from world leaders that I've had, about 18 of them or 20 so far, I'm not sure the exact number, in the week since we won the election, I've been struck by how much they're looking forward to the United States reasserting its historic role as a global leader both in the Pacific as well as the Atlantic, all across the world. The team meets this moment, this team behind me. They embody my core beliefs that America is strongest when it works with its allies. Collectively, this team has secured some of the most defining national security and diplomatic achievements in recent memory, made possible through decades of experience working with our partners. That's how we truly keep America safe without engaging in needless military conflicts and our adversaries in check and terrorists at bay. And that's how we counter terrorism and extremism, control this pandemic and future ones, deal with the climate crisis, nuclear proliferation, cyber threats and emerging technologies that spread authoritarianism, and so much more. And while this team has unmatched experience and accomplishments, they also reflect the idea that we cannot meet these challenges with old thinking and unchanged habits. For example, we're going to have the first woman lead the intelligence community, the first Latino, an immigrant, to lead the Department of Homeland Security, and a groundbreaking diplomat at the United Nations. We're going to have a principal on the National Security Council whose full-time job is to fight climate change. For the first time ever, that will occur. And my national security team will be coordinated by one of the youngest national security advisors in decades. Experience and leadership, fresh thinking and perspective, and an unrelenting belief in the promise of America. I've long said that America leads not only by the example of our power, but by the power of our example. And I'm proud to put forward this incredible team that will lead by example. As Secretary of State, I nominate Tony Blinken. He's one of the better prepared for this job. No one's better prepared, in my view. He will be the Secretary of State who previously served in top roles on Capitol Hill, in the White House, and in the State Department. He delivered for the American people in each place. For example, leading our diplomatic efforts in the fight against ISIS, strengthening America's alliance and positions in the Asia Pacific, guiding our responses to the global refugee crisis with compassion and determination. And he will rebuild morale and trust in the State Department where his career, where his career in government began. And he starts off with the kind of relationships around the world that many of his predecessors have had to build over the years. I know. I've seen him in action. Tony's been one of my closest and most trusted advisors. I know him and his family immigrants and refugees, a Holocaust survivor, who taught him to never take for granted the very idea of America as a place of possibilities. Possibilities. Tony is ready on day one. As Secretary for Homeland Security, I nominate Alejandro Mayorkas. This is one of the hardest jobs in government, a gigantic agency. The DHS Secretary needs to keep us safe, from threats at home and from abroad. And it's, and it's the job that plays a critical role in fixing our broken immigration system. After years of chaos, dysfunction, and absolute cruelty at DHS, I'm proud to nominate an experienced leader 
who has been hailed by both Democrats and Republicans. Ali, as he goes by, is a former U.S. attorney, former director of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, and a former DH, DHS Deputy Secretary. Helped implement DACA, prevented attacks on the homeland, enhanced our cybersecurity, helped communities recover from natural disaster, combated Ebola and Zika. And while DHS affects everyone, given its critical role in immigration matters, I'm proud that for the first time ever, the department will be led by an immigrant, a Latino, who knows that we are a nation of laws and values. And one more thing, today's his birthday. Happy birthday, man. Happy birthday. He's 21. <laughs> As a director of national intelligence, I nominate Avril Haines, the first woman ever to hold this post. To lead our intelligence community, I didn't pick a politician or a political figure. I picked a professional. She is eminently qualified. Former deputy director of the CIA, former deputy national security advisor to President Obama, and a fierce advocate for telling the truth and leveling with her decisions with the decision makers. Straight up. Nothing unnecessary. I know because I've worked with her for over a decade. Brilliant, humble, can talk literature and theoretical physics, fixing cars, flying planes, running a bookstore cafe, all in a single conversation <laughs> because she's done all that. And above all, she gets word of a threat, if she gets word of a threat coming to our shores, like another pandemic or a foreign interference in our elections, she will not stop raising alarms until the right people take action. People will be able to take her word because she always calls it as she sees it. I believe we are safer with Avril on the watch. I think we think she can make a great contribution. And as United, Ambassador, United States Ambassador to the United Nations, I nominate Linda Thomas Greenfield, a seasoned and distinguished diplomat with 35 years in the Foreign Service who never forgot where she came from, growing up in segregated Louisiana. The eldest of eight, her dad couldn't read or write, but she says he was the smartest person she knew. First in her family to go to, to graduate from high school, then college, with the whole world literally ahead of her as her dad and mom taught her to believe. Post in Switzerland, Pakistan, Kenya, the Gambia, Nigeria, Jamaica, Liberia, where she was known as the People's Ambassador. Willing to meet with anyone, an ambassador, a student, working people struggling to get by and always treating them with the same level of dignity and respect. She was our top State Department official in charge of African policy during the Ebola crisis. She received overwhelming support from her fellow career Foreign Service officers. And she'll be a cabinet status I've, because I want to hear her voice on all the major foreign policy discussions we have. And my national security advisor, I choose Jake Sullivan. He's once in a generation intellect with experience and temperament for one of the toughest jobs in the world. When I was vice president, he served as my national security advisor. He was a top advisor to Secretary of State Clinton. He helped lead the early negotiations that led to the Iran nuclear deal. He helped broker the Gaza ceasefire in 2012, played a key role in Asian Pacific rebalance in our administration. And in this campaign for the presidency, he served as one of my most trusted advisors on both foreign and domestic policy, including helped me develop our COVID-19 strategy. Jake understands my vision that economic security is national security, and it helps steer what I call a foreign policy for the middle class for families like his growing up in Minnesota, where he was raised by parents who were educators and taught him the values of hard work, decency, service, and respect. What that means is to win the competition for the future. We need to keep us safe and secure and build back better than ever. We need to invest in our people, sharpen our innovative edge, unite the economic might of our democracies around the world to grow the middle class and reduce inequity, and do things like counter predatory trade practices that are competitors and, of our competitors and our adversaries. And before I talk about the final person today, 
Let me talk about this new position. For the first time ever, the United States will have a full-time climate leader who participate in, min in ministerial level meetings. And that's a fancy way of saying they'll have a seat at every table around the world. For the first time ever, he will be a, there will be a principal on the National Security Council who can make sure climate change is on the agenda in the Situation Room. And for the first time ever, we will have a presidential envoy on climate. He will be matched with high-level White House climate policy coordinator and policy-making structure to be announced in December. And that will lead efforts here in the United States to combat the climate crisis, mobilize action to meet the existential threat that we face. Let me be clear. I don't for a minute underestimate the difficulties of meeting my bold commitments to fighting climate change. But at the same time, no one should underestimate for a minute my determination to do just that. And as for the man himself, if I had a former Secretary of State who helped negotiate the Paris Climate Accord, or a former presidential nominee, or a former leading senator, or the head of a major climate organization for the job, I would show my, they would show my commitment to the United States and the whole world. The fact that I pick the one person who has all of these things speaks unambiguously to my commitment. The world would know that with one of my closest friends, John Kerry, he's speaking for America on one of the most pressing threats of our time. No one I trust more. To this team, I thank them for accepting this call to service. And for their families, I thank you all for your sacrifice. You know, we could do, uh, we could not do this without you, in my view. Together, these public servants will restore America globally its global leadership, and its moral leadership, and will ensure that our service members, diplomats, and intelligence professionals can do their job free of politics. They'll not only repair, they'll also reimagine American foreign policy and national security for the next generation. And they'll tell me what I need to know, not what I want to know, what I need to know. To the American people, this team will make us proud to be Americans. And as more states certify the results of this election, there's progress to wrap up our victory. You know, I'm pleased to have received the ascertainment from GSA to carry out a smooth and peaceful transition of power so our teams can prepare to meet the challenges at hand, to control the pandemic, to build back better, and to protect the safety and security of the American people. And to the United States Senate, I hope these outstanding nominees received a prompt hearing and that we can work across the aisle in good faith to move forward for the country. Let's begin that work to heal and unite, to heal and unite America as well as the world. I want to thank you all. May God bless you. May God protect our troops. And now I turn this over, this new team, starting with our next Secretary of State, Tony Blinken. Get my mask here, Tony, so I don't get in trouble. And we're going to clean off the podium. Good afternoon. Mr. President-elect, Vice President-elect Harris, thank you for your trust and your confidence. If confirmed by the United States Senate, I will do everything I can to earn it. Mr. President-elect, working for you, having you as a mentor and friend, has been the greatest privilege of my professional life. So many people have brought me to this day, from college classmates to bandmates, my colleagues in the Clinton and Obama administrations, in the Senate, and at the State Department. I thank them all, and I ask forgiveness for my insatiable appetite for bad puns. Mostly, I'd like to thank my family, sisters and sisters-in-law, brothers-in-law, nieces and nephews, my wonderful in-laws, the Ryans, and especially my wife, Evan Ryan, and our children, John and Lila. They are truly 
my greatest blessings. For my family, uh, as for so many generations of Americans, America has literally been the last best hope on earth. We are going to break away from that news conference and get back to our newscast here in just a second. But if you're just joining us, President-elect Joe Biden has announced several members of his cabinet that he has nominated. They still have to go before the Senate and be voted on and then uh, approved. If they are, they will be members of the new president's cabinet. The secretary of state he nominated was Tony Blanklin. He worked for the Obama administration and has worked for Biden over the years, one of Biden's closest advisors. Also, the first immigrant Latino nominated for Secretary of Homeland Security. His name is Alejandro Mayor Cas, who uh, has worked for many years for DHS, I believe, and is now going to be shifting over to the Department of Homeland Security. Yeah, we're just running down these names for you, just in case you missed. Director of National Intelligence is Avril Haines. She also worked uh, worked for the Biden for about a year. And she's the first woman to head up an intelligence agency. Uh, and then uh, one of my fellow Louisiana residents, or former residents, uh, Louisiana, uh, Louisiana's Linda Thomas Greenfield Field is going to be the new UN ambassador if she's approved by the Senate Confirmation Committee. Yeah, she's the first in her family to graduate from high school and go on and graduate from college and been stationed all over the world. So she's got an immense amount of intellect from areas all over the United States and across the world. National Security Advisor is Jake Sullivan. He has been an advisor to Biden during his campaign and was also part of the Obama administration. And something that uh, uh, President-elect Joe Biden had talked about a lot was his commitment to climate change. So he's created a position, an envoy, a presidential envoy for climate, and that is going to be former Secretary of State uh, John Kerry. A brand new position. We are not clear yet if that's going to need to be confirmed by the Senate. Yeah, one thing that uh, Biden did say when he uh, put these folks forward was he was looking to restore global and moral leadership. So we'll see what the uh, Senate does with those nominees. Of course, we have to wait till the Senate is um, seated and ready yeah. to go in January after the uh, special election from Georgia. But Justin Horn is ready to go on weather. We'll be back after this with that. Welcome back. Let's take a look at the radar, show you that there are still some showers on the radar. It was nice to see that this morning, a little bit different from the past, well, few weeks where it has been very dry. Some showers working their way through Quero and Howitzville at this hour, working towards Highway 77. Most of the shower activity here in San Antonio coming to an end. And in fact, we're starting to see some sun out there. We'll end up being a warm afternoon, but very humid. Let's look at some of the observed rainfall totals. And they weren't much. Uh, it's not all that much to get excited about, but seven hundredths of an inch. At least there was some accumulation. It has been a long while since we've been able to say that. New Braunfels about two hundredths of an inch. San Marcos four hundredths of an inch. Not big numbers, but we think down the line Friday into Saturday, we will get some bigger numbers. Rain chances looking a little bit better as we go forward in time here. 73 degrees right now. Cloudy skies at the airport. Southerly winds at about 13 miles per hour. Dew points are way up there. It's humid and you look at the cloud cover. Still some here across Bear County, but some breaks off to the east, up to the north around Kerrville. You're seeing a little bit of sun and temperature wise. We're sitting in the mid 70s in Randolph, 75 New Braunfels, 70 Bernie stage, 77 right now in Castroville. Already some 80s on the map down there around Pleasanton, Catula and Kennedy. And it looks like these clouds are continuing to sort of thin out. We'll see more sun throughout the rest of the afternoon. As far as the dew points are concerned, yes, it is humid. We've got dew points close to 70 in some cases. But uh, they will fall off significantly by tomorrow morning as a frontal boundary works through, and then we'll get 30s coming into tomorrow. It'll be a lot drier, and we'll see plenty of sun on your on your Wednesday too. Here's the setup. We've got a lot of moisture coming up out ahead of our next storm system, which right now is over the Four Corners region. That's going to swing through, push the front through tomorrow morning. So that's our first system. Then we go up towards Alaska. This is our next system. This is going to dive south and throw some energy into Texas. This is also going to push a cold front through and probably our best chances for rain that we've seen in a while will come with this system. So here's how it plays out. As we get into tomorrow morning, I'd say 4 a.m. anywhere to 7 a.m. pre-dawn. Frontal boundary works through. There's an outside chance of a shower or two across our eastern counties, but not likely. Then sunny and clear for the rest of your Wednesday. Most of Thanksgiving looks pretty good, too. We'll see an increase in cloud cover during the afternoon. 
but all in all, a, a nice day. By Friday, our frontal battery starts to work in. There's still some questions about the timing, but regardless, it should bring some rain chances, some decent rain chances on Friday and uh, even into Saturday. That's the way it's looking right now, and there could be some pockets of heavier rain. We haven't been able to say that in a while either. So there, there's a look at the rain chances, 40% both Friday and Saturday, and uh, we may be able to raise those rain chances some as we get a little bit closer. 77 coming up tomorrow, drier. 78 Thursday, by the way, we'll top out near 80 today. Notice the low though Thursday morning it will be in the 40s. It'll be chilly to start Thanksgiving. 74 Friday, 40% chance of rain and then cooler over the weekend behind that front with highs in the 60s and rain chances lingering on Saturday. We'll be right back. We want to take a look at the stock market. The Dow Jones Industrial Average trading above 30,000 points. That is the first time ever as progress continues to develop around the coronavirus vaccines. Yeah, the Dow rose more than 400 points or 1.4% today. The S&P 500 index rose 1.3% so far. Never thought I'd see the day of that. The U.S. setting a new record as well for current hospitalizations for the 14th consecutive day. ABC's Victor Akendo reports with millions of Americans on the move for Thanksgiving. Demand for testing is soaring with one new warning from one of the country's top labs. Labs across the country are strained and warning people to expect longer turnaround times for results. And here's part of the reason why. People started lining up here outside of Hard Rock Stadium in Miami Gardens nearly four hours before the testing site even opened. Just yesterday, they tested more than 3,300 people just shy of the record, and it's shaping up to be another busy day. Quest Diagnostics, one of the biggest private testing labs in the United States, says the demand for COVID test is so great, testing should be reserved for symptomatic and exposed patients. Although recommendations by public health officials say testing asymptomatic carriers is key to controlling the virus. Health and Human Services telling ABC News that the vast majority of labs are producing results in about three to five days. Across the country, people lining up to get tested, some waiting up to eight hours for a test, others unable to find an available test at all. Since the beginning of this month, there have been more than 3 million confirmed cases. More than 25,000 people have died. That's about one American death every minute. New York, once the epicenter of the pandemic, now seeing a surge in cases so great, the governor is opening another field hospital. The situation is dire in Pennsylvania, where officials say they may run out of ICU beds by next week. The Midwest now has twice as many people hospitalized per capita than the Northeast and the West. Hospitalizations in Ohio are now up more than 50% in the past two weeks. But finally, some hope the government will begin distributing Regeneron's antibody treatment today. That's the same treatment that President Trump received at Walter Reed earlier this year. You just have so many people that are hoping for that negative test result before Thanksgiving, but officials warn that a negative test could create a false sense of security. Victor Okendo, ABC News, Miami Gardens. And as the pandemic worsens, paper products are flying off the shelves once again. Some stores have placed limits on toilet paper, paper towels, and soap. Walmart says toilet paper and cleaning supplies are in high demand. Meanwhile, Target says it's prioritizing essential items and fast-tracking them through the supply chain. Meantime, back here at home, HEB stores also setting purchase limits on high-demand items. Some include disinfecting and antibacterial sprays and wipes, toilet paper and paper towels. There are also limits on some food items like brisket. You can find more information on more limits at HEB right now on KSET.com. We are watching your weather for the holiday weekend about to begin. Uh, rainy this morning, but it looks like the sun's trying to come out. It was a damp start. We had a, a ton of moisture coming into South Texas. It uh, enhanced our drizzle. We actually did see some light showers on radar, so it was actually pretty nice to see starting to go away now. We're going to see the sun pop out. Take a look at this picture on our case I connect. And uh, this viewer wanted to know, what is this? There's stuff falling from the gray floofs. Indeed. It's been a while since we've seen that uh, great picture. We appreciate it as always. And as we look at the radar right now, there are still some showers here across Richardson County. So places like Howitzville over towards Quero still seeing a few showers. 
Uh, but the cloud cover here around San Antonio starting to scatter out. There's some peaks of sun already, and that will boost temperatures. We think we will be up near 80 again today, and certainly out west, places like Del Rio and Eagle Pass, you're seeing clear skies at this hour. Temperature-wise, 70 Bernie Stage, 75 Randolph, already up to 81 in Pleasanton, and, and 78 out there in Honda. Rain chances this week, we had a little bit this morning. They drop off tomorrow and Thursday, but pick back up Friday and Saturday. Our hope is that we will get some decent rain with our next storm system for today. Expect those temperatures again up near 80. We'll be down to 77 at 6 o'clock and 73 by 8 o'clock. Guys. Thank you, Justin. About 7 million GM vehicles are being recalled due to dangerous airbags. We'll tell you what you need to look out for still ahead. Hello, everyone. This is your daily tech and business briefing from Cheddar. A win for German women in the workforce is Germany's coalition government introducing a mandatory quota for women on boards of listed companies. As part of the deal, public companies with management boards of three or more executives must now appoint at least one woman to an executive position. The move is being lauded as a historic first step for gender equality in German boardrooms. Meanwhile, a Sherman Williams employee has now been fired. That after posting a viral TikTok that garnered over 1.4 million views, the video showed the employee mixing blue berries with white paint, all to create a light blue paint color. While well, the video was made during work hours, and the company says that that video was seriously embarrassing to the company and their products. And Google and Disney now teaming up for a new Mandalorian AR experience featuring the one and only Baby Yoda. The experience lets users harness the force, allowing them to follow along with their favorite characters in AR. Now, one minor detail for now, the Mandalorian AR experience only supported on compatible 5G Android devices. And that's your Cheddar Business and Tech Update. I'm Baker Machado, coming to you from Cheddar Studios in Lower Manhattan. In your consumer news or more consumer news, check out your refrigerator. Dole Fresh Vegetables now recalling certain organic romaine hearts due to the risk of E. coli. The FDA has said that the harvest dates of October 23rd and 26th are suspect. The recall includes wild harvest organic romaine lettuce hearts and Dole Organic Romaine Hearts three packs. The Dole brand packages have text in English and in French. Uh, they were sold in stores in 15 states, and no one has gotten sick. That's the good news. But a sample tested positive during a routine test. GM recalling about 7 million vehicles worldwide after losing a four-year battle with regulators. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration mandated the recall, saying the Takata airbags in the vehicles are dangerous. They're linked to 17 deaths. The largest auto recall in history has now taken place. The administration is ordering the recall of certain vehicles with model years 2007 to 2014. They include the Cadillac Escalade, Chevy Avalanche, Silverado Suburban, Tago, and the GMC Sierra and Yukon. Are we all done with this rain, Justin? At least, at least for today we are. Now, there are some rain chances down the line, and it's, it's nice to be able to put rain chances in the seven-day forecast. 73 degrees so far today. 65 was low this morning. That's it. We had a lot of moisture pouring in here, and that's why we saw some of the showers and drizzle earlier. Records are 85 set back in 2010. Record lows 25 set back in 1970. We haven't seen any numbers like that so far this fall, but it does get colder by the weekend. Pretty good-looking cold front heads our way. We'll talk more about it coming up. The Daily Show host and comedian Trevor Noah will be hosting the 2021 Grammy Awards. The Recording Academy made the announcement just a few hours before the nominees for the upcoming show were revealed. This would be Mark Noah's, would, this would mark Noah's first time hosting the Grammys, which would be held on January 31st. So this looks like it's going to work out pretty well. We got a little bit of rain this morning, just, just, just a little bit, and then it's going to hold off on Thursday and then Friday and Saturday, more rain. We I could mean, use more rain. Oh, yeah, so. a lot of it. But, but and it's going to looks like it's going to be really pleasant on Thanksgiving Day if you are planning to do your Thanksgiving dinner outside. Yes, we're going to squeeze in a, a real good looking Thanksgiving Day. So that that is the good news. And we, we got some rain in the forecast, too. All good. And very quickly, I got to mention, no shave November. Looking pretty good, David, by the way, like the beard. Thank you. Uh, we're so thankful that we've raised a good amount of money. Uh, organization, something like third in the country. 
I uh, can't believe KSAT, that. Raising money. South Texas is, awesome. is so awesome. Always coming go through. Go team, go. We certainly appreciate it. It's for a great cause. So thank you so much for all those who have donated. Okay. I still say you need an axe and a flannel shirt. Uh, I don't know. I don't know about that. But, I, you know, I like it. I do like the beard. Like a lumberjack. Uh, hmm. Well, let's take a look at the radar, and uh, we've got some showers out there east of San Antonio moving towards Howitzville and Cuero, Goliad, Victoria. These are moving away from San Antonio, and uh, we're seeing some clearing skies here in Bear County. So things are going to get a little less cloudy, and you'll see more sun this afternoon, which will boost those temperatures. Big picture here. You can see the rain moving east. There's good amount of moisture being pulled in out ahead of our next storm system, and that's why we saw some of that more steady rain and drizzle this morning. Uh, there is the cloud cover here across Bear County, and yes, it is starting to scatter out. Just looking at some of the transguide pictures, we are seeing the sun beginning to pop out. We can see that there on live camp. 73 degrees, southerly winds at about 13 miles per hour. 72 Canyon Lake, 75 Comfort, 76 Kerrville, 78 Hondo, 81 down there in Pleasanton, 84 Catula, 77 Del Rio, 72 Rock Springs. It's turning into a pretty nice afternoon, although it is going to be a little humid. These dew points are in the upper 60s, close to 70 in some cases around Beeville. That is very humid air, more spring-like, but uh, we'll see this go away pretty quickly. Just as quickly as it's moved in, we'll see it go away tomorrow morning as a cold front slides through and takes away all of that humidity. You can see the moisture being pulled in out ahead of our next storm system, which right now is over the Four Corners region. That's going to slide through uh, tomorrow. And for us, this isn't really going to produce all that much rain. It'll, it'll bring the front through, but just not a lot of rain with it. The one behind it, though, this one is more promising. This will be in here by Friday into Saturday, and this one should bring some decent rain with it. So here's what our forecast looks like. That first initial front comes through pre-dawn tomorrow. Can't rule out a, sh a shower right along the front, but chances are very, very low. Sunny skies, drier tomorrow. On Thursday, still a great day. We will get a little bit more cloud cover, I think, by the afternoon. And then on Friday, here comes our next front. And this is going to kick off some showers and even some thunderstorms. There's still some questions on the timing of the front. But regardless, we think rain chances are pretty good on Friday and probably will linger into Saturday. So the, the chances are there for a couple of days of some good rain. Uh, 79 degrees up to actually 80 this afternoon will go for a high. This guys will be partly cloudy as we go into tonight. It will be a bit breezy throughout the afternoon today. Southerly winds 10 to 15 miles per hour. We'll see some breezy winds tomorrow, but this time they'll be out of the northwest behind that front. 77 and because of the dry air, we drop all the way down to 48 Thanksgiving morning and then rebound into the upper 70s by the afternoon with some added cloud cover. More clouds on Friday, 40% chance of rain, 74. Cools down behind the front, 40% chance of rain Saturday, 61. And then look for clearing skies Sunday. But as we go into next week, it will get chilly. I'll point out that 38 Monday morning. We think some pretty cool air will be working in by early next week. We'll be right back. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. It will be remembered as the first road win for the Dallas Cowboys this year over Minnesota, but a lot of players and coaches will just know it as the Gallagher game or the sledgehammer game, depending on how old you are. And if you remember comedian Gallagher and his bit with smashing a watermelon on stage, stuff flying everywhere. Hey, Coach Mike McCarthy borrowed his bit smashing watermelons. It all happened in a hotel room before the Cowboys were set to play the Vikings on Sunday. According to the NFL Network, while McCarthy was talking to his team, having that team meeting, Staff members rolled out watermelons with goals written on them, including the final one that had a picture posted of Vikings running back Dalvin Cook. McCarthy took a sledgehammer and started pounding the watermelons, spraying, you know, watermelon stuff all over the ballroom. Much of the players' delight. They loved it. And the final one left for Demarcus Lawrence, who wanted to smash the watermelon with Cook's picture on it. As it turns out, the Cowboys' defense came up with two forced fumbles by Donovan Wilson, one on Cook that was recovered by Tank. Today, McCarthy, or yesterday, McCarthy addressed his motivational tactic that led to the Cowboys' 31-28 victory, the first road win of the season, and the first win without Dak Prescott. It's important to have fun. You're, you're always trying to, you know, create emphasis in your messaging, and, and, and that's really where it came from. We're just using the approach, just honoring a great comedian, you know, Gallagher, and uh, it's just an idea that came up, and uh, we went for it, and, and uh, the players were, were into it, and, and we had some fun with it. 
All right, the Cowboys play on Thanksgiving afternoon against Washington at 335, and we're just getting in some breaking news from the Cowboys camp up there in Arlington in Dallas. The circumstances speak for the severity of the situation. That is a statement from the Dallas Cowboys themselves about the reason that they canceled practice this afternoon. So we'll have more for you on that. So it sounds like a pretty serious situation up there at, uh, at the uh, Cowboys complex. Certainly does. Well, we're going to head over to SA Live now down at Market Square. Hey, guys. How are you? Happy almost Thanksgiving. Yes, happy Cheers almost to that. Thanksgiving. We'll <laughs> drink to that. Look at the little mini margaritas. Yes. Guess how much they are? 75 cents. 75 cents. <laughs> right now, well, starting in about four minutes through 3.30, there's some other great deals right yes, here yes. at uh, you have to stick around for those deals. About it. Speaking of La Familia Cortez, they also have a great recipe with those turkey leftovers. Just three ingredients. That's all you'll need for this perfect soup to keep you warm with those turkey leftovers. Yep, especially looking at that forecast that jo Justin was talking about for next week. Hey, shop local. You know, Friday's Black oh, Friday, yeah. Saturday, we get Elsa Fernandez, our dear friend is here and you've got something special, right? Yes, Shop Small Saturday is this Saturday and we have a little sneak peek of the latest Shop local makeup palette you can buy. Can't see on that. Can't see yet. Yes. Great no ideas peak. <laughs> to help out local folks. And you love your coffee, don't you? Yeah, I sure do. We take you to the hill country for the perfect quaint little spot where you can do some vintage. I like to call it vintage antique shopping with some Java too. It's all a win-win, right. all right? <laughs> Up to this point, you probably have already been to the grocery store and all the crowds out there and gotten your turkey. So the big question is, how do you cook your turkey mm. in the oven? in the deep fryer, Ooh. maybe in the smoker. Ooh, they all sound good. Let all us know. <laughs> something like that. Plus a recap of uh, Dance with the Stars. Oh, yes, the Coming big up. finale. 